Women couldn't vote, not because they weren't citizens, it was because they were deemed to be inherently dependent. Dependent on a father, dependent on a husband. But what say you live in Nantucket and your husband makes his living sailing on the whaling ships? He's gone for three years. Somebody's got to run the family business, maintain the home, enter into contracts, deal with the estate. So here you have a woman who's doing effectively what was deemed a man's job, who does not have a male superior to her who's local, who's around, who has a necessary property, and so in many cases they allowed the woman to vote for the family. And then let's say your husband who's off on a whaling ship, the ship sinks. You inherit the family property. You've got enough property to vote. You're running a family business. Well, where's the dependency? And so in those situations, usually involving widowed women, or women who never married, but the males in her family had died out. If they had the property, they could vote. It was a small number, and what happens about the late 1820s is states begin to hold a series of state constitutional conventions, and they begin to fiddle with the rules about who can vote. And one of the things that they do is they make it explicit that in those situations, women could not vote. The women's suffrage movement got its start in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. The movement was primarily headed by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The movement really grew out of the abolitionist movement. And so because of that, they aligned themselves with people like Frederick Douglass in order to both fight for not only women's rights, but the rights of African Americans. The ability of women to gain the franchise is an extraordinary political story at many, many levels because it means that men voted to dilute their votes by allowing an equal or slightly greater number of women to vote as well. The women's movement was a major political mobilization, but it was a mobilization of respectable middle-class women. My great-great-grandmother was a pioneer in the suffrage movement. And she was one of the early ones in 1848, starting in Seneca Falls. And she was part of the co-convener of the first Women's Rights Convention. Elizabeth Cady Stanton grew up in the early 1800s. And in her town, in upstate New York, she grew up with law all around her. Her father was an attorney and she would listen at his door of his office. He would have clients coming to visit. And she would listen and was becoming extremely concerned about how the laws were affecting women in particular because they didn't have rights. One of the stories was she was given a necklace, a coral necklace from her father, who she adored. But she was told, when you get married, you will no longer own that necklace. It will belong to your husband. And if he wishes to sell that necklace, he has every right to do so. He could even sell it for tobacco and smoke it up. She was outraged that she didn't have the right to her property. So she understood the importance of law and rights. And one of the things that she always heard every single year at July 4th is the reading of the Declaration of Independence. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton and this small handful of women said, hey, those are great ideas. They have to also be applied to women. For instance, they couldn't own property in their own name. When they were married, if they had a job, they couldn't own their own wages. They couldn't vote for the people that were representing them. So she saw an enormous amount of unfairness. But in order to change society, you had to vote and make sure that the people who represented you represented your vision of what a good society is.
Elizabeth Cady Stanton on her honeymoon, part of it was to attend the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. That was 1840. And when she was there, she met others, Lucretia Mott in particular, who's from Nantucket, Massachusetts, and they built a tremendous friendship. And Lucretia Mott was someone who had a great passion about equality as a Quaker in particular. And I think that Elizabeth Cady Stanton found a soulmate, certainly in terms of someone who understood the challenges that women face and their lack of rights. So they go to this convention and there was a vote taken and it turns out that women were not allowed to vote or given full equal rights at the convention. In fact, needed to sit, they were seated separately. And William Lloyd Garrison was a great abolitionist and he was there and he was so outraged by this ruling that he decided he would forfeit his vote and join them. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, with all of her wonderful schooling, drafted the Declaration of Sentiments, that's what she called it, based on the Declaration of Independence. Included in this were basic rights for property and so forth for women. But at the end of this list, she included and insisted on including that women get the right to vote. Lucretia Mott, a very dignified woman, said to ask for the vote is too controversial. But Frederick Douglass, who was a part of this group, agreed with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and helped convince people that giving women the right to vote was critical. So it was included, it was voted on, and the Declaration of Sentiments drafted by Elizabeth Cady Stanton was adopted. This convention that they had in 1848 in Seneca Falls, it was the first among many in 1850, it became what was then called the National Women's Rights Convention, and the first one was held in Worcester, Massachusetts. At this time, women were not accustomed to speaking in public, nor were they encouraged to do so. They were discouraged from doing so. It wasn't considered ladylike to speak in public, so women didn't have the skills they were nervous about it, and it was hard for them to do. Abby Kelly Foster, who is a wonderful advocate, was one of the convention speakers, and she was excellent. And she had gone to Oberlin College, where there was a young student named Lucy Stone from Massachusetts. And Lucy heard her and became very enraptured by this, and that was the beginning of Lucy Stone becoming a big advocate for women's rights. Lucy Stone, when she married, she kept her name, and people who did that were then called stoners. The interesting thing about the bloomers is that when the suffragists began wearing them, they were ridiculed, they were made fun of, they were talked about in terms of their clothing and how ridiculous these outfits were. Susan B. Anthony, for instance, wore bloomers when she gave speeches and it became such a distraction she gave it up and decided she couldn't compete with that. So back to Amelia Bloomer, she introduced Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and she introduced them in Seneca Falls. They formed a bond that lasted 50 years, and they were very different from each other, and yet they could work together. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's a mother. She has seven children. Susan B. Anthony decides not to get married and had obviously a lot more mobility. And so Susan B. Anthony would come over to Stanton's house and said, you go write a speech. Um, I'll mind the children and I'll stir the pudding. And Susan would go out in the nation delivering the speech, but also bring back a lot of facts and ideas. 
It wasn't until the 14th and 15th Amendments and debates around African-American suffrage in particular that you start to see fissures in the movement, in part because of the insertion of the word male in Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. So Section 2 of the 14th Amendment allows Congress to reduce a state's delegation in the House of Representatives if the state abridges the right to vote but abridges the right to vote of males who are 21 years or older and citizens. And so Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony in particular objected to that language. Frederick Douglass felt that everyone should sort of coalesce behind African-American male suffrage right now, and then we would come back to women. But of course their position was, well, when is it our turn? The 15th Amendment prohibited discrimination in voting on the basis of race. The key element there is that the states precluded women from voting and that was acceptable. So the focus on African-American men to the exclusion of white women and African-American women really was a breaking point for the women's suffrage movement relative to the fight for civil rights for African-Americans. One of the biggest problems is that you see members of the women's suffrage movement start to use very racialized language in objecting to the 15th Amendment in particular. One thing that they wanted to do was contrast the votes of wealthy, educated white women as a means of offsetting the votes of African-American men who are less educated and they just emerged from slavery. And so they tried to sort of make the case for white women's suffrage in particular by using racialized language that caused even broader separation in the movement between Douglas and advocates like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, one of the great figures in American history, said, do we really want to give the vote to the lower orders of Irish, African, and Chinese people? What women were saying is, look, you're giving votes to these immigrants who are not American, and here we are women born in America, raised in America, generations in America. Shouldn't we have the vote to counteract their un-Americanness when it came to the vote? In the late 19th century, the women's suffrage movement makes a turn for about 15 years towards embracing what was called educated suffrage. And in effect, they were calling for literacy tests. And the part of the argument that they were making was that if you had literacy tests, if you had educated suffrage, including for women, that you would greatly increase, in effect, the number of middle class and upper middle class uh, voters uh, proportionally because you would add middle class white women and be subtracting out working class and black men who were not literate. They also aligned themselves with the temperance movement, which was heavily anti-immigrant, and they feared all these swarthy Eastern Europeans, Southern Europeans who were coming into America and who liked to drink beer and wine. The amount that people drank back in the late 1800s created tremendous problems because there were men who would drink after work and became alcoholics. So it was considered a social ill that was really harming women because we know when women didn't have the right to property, it also meant they didn't have the right to their own money. Even if they were working, their earnings were turned over to their husbands. So the temperance movement to prohibit alcohol was gaining and Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and other suffragists joined with this effort. So together they worked for women's right to get the vote and for the Prohibition Amendment, hoping that it would improve their lives. The women's movement also had huge tension with the labor movement, which was a major democratizing force in Reconstruction, post-Civil War United States, but which was extremely hostile to breaking down gender barriers because they represented craft union workers who had a monopoly on certain trades and were fearful of opening those up. It was about this time that the first states to grant women the right to vote were in the West. 
because they wanted to attract people to come west and they needed women to go west. So they did give them more rights. They participated more in society and they used it. They knew women would be attracted to having their rights. California was one of them. But one of the problems that women still face with respect to exercising that right to vote is that if they married a foreigner or someone who was a non-citizen, they could lose their right to vote. Marital expatriation is what it was called. New York State is the first state east of the Mississippi that, at the time, granted women the right to vote. We've been talking about higher levels of office, president, senator, representative, state representative, but actually school boards did allow women to run. The women's suffrage movement was effective in changing laws at the state level. But also, these women sued, right? They sued in federal court. They challenged state laws that disenfranchise women as unrepublican in form. They challenged state laws that disenfranchise women as a violation of the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. In a famous case called Minor versus Happersat, Virginia Minor, who was the plaintiff in that case, couldn't even file her petition in federal court. She had to have her husband file it for her because women weren't allowed to do that. Um, so she had to have her husband file her petition to challenge a law that would not allow her to vote. So in Minor versus Happersat, the Supreme Court held that voting was not a privilege or immunity of citizenship, further cementing the separation between being a citizen and being a voter. And so women, our citizens, right, the, the court affirmed that, but they did not necessarily have to be voters. Another thing that happened often when women would be asking for the vote, both in this country and England and elsewhere, is they were considered to be crazy. And there were stories of women being institutionalized as being insane. The notion that they would have these ideas about freedom and independence and rights were so alien to people that they often were literally considered crazy. In 1913, the day before President Wilson's inauguration, suffragettes staged a parade. And so they were able to make this really powerful statement about support for women's suffrage to the nation. And in particular, because it was done in connection with the presidential inauguration, when you really do have the eyes of the country on Washington, D.C. Leading the parade on a white horse was a woman named Inez Milholland. She was an attorney, very unusual in those days. She could not attend Yale Law School where she wanted to go because they did not accept women. But she did go to New York University Law School and became an attorney in New York. She was a passionate advocate for women's rights and turned out to be a spectacular speaker and would attract large crowds. There was police presence, but at some point the crowd got rowdy and they started throwing things at them and tearing at their skirts and at their banners and it broke out into a riot and I believe there were hundreds who were hospitalized. And the next day in the newspaper it was front page news. Interestingly, the old guard of the suffrage movement was horrified, but Alice Paul was thrilled that it was on the front page of the paper because it meant people would learn about the movement and come to know what it was taking for women to try to get the vote. This doesn't really effectively cover the fact that there were still fissures within the women's suffrage movement. 
African-American women had to march at the back of the parade, which further highlighted the dilemma faced by African-American women who were dealing with maybe misogyny from African-American men who didn't think women should vote, but also the race issue from, from white suffragettes who didn't think African-American women were equal. Yet these women still turned out, they still marched. History often overlooks the, the dilemma that they faced as being African-American women in a world where race and gender was not prized. Yet it was black women who were maids, uh, who were in white homes, who heard white men talking about their tactics to suppress the female vote, who would then tell the suffragettes, you know, I was cooking for Miss So-and-so this morning and they're planning on doing this or that this afternoon. So black women, they were a conduit for information that helped to advance the suffragette movement, but yet had to shrink in the background so as not to provide a visible presence that would be perceived as even more of a threat by white men. One of the issues that came out of this parade was about inclusion. There was a woman by the name of Ida B. Wells who was working very hard for civil rights, women's rights, for African-American rights. She worked tirelessly against lynching. She was really passionate about doing what she could to try to stop these horrific lynchings. She also was a suffragist and asked to march in the parade with her delegation from her home state. She was told that she would have to march with the other African-American women at the back of the parade. She didn't listen, and she snuck in and walked with her state in the parade and was defiant. And it was about this time as well, along with the parade, that an African-American sorority began called the Deltas, and they're still strong today. And they began in 1913 around this parade. And in 2013, they replicated the parade in Washington, D.C. for the Deltas. After the 1913 parade, Inez Melholland did attract crowds as she spoke throughout the country. Unfortunately, she also was sick and became sicker and sicker. And of course, she was pushing herself terribly. So. In 1916, in October, she was in Los Angeles on stage speaking, and she said, I would ask President Wilson, how long must we wait? How long must this heartbreaking struggle for justice go on? With those words, Inez Milholland collapsed and was taken by ambulance to the hospital where she died about a month later. And she was only about 30 years old. And she did become a martyr and someone who symbolized the fight for women to get the vote. protests and pickets in front of the White House for the first time. You had hunger strikes. So many of the creative tactics of nonviolent protest that were used by others were pioneered by the women fighting for the right to vote. The women who were picketing the White House called themselves the Silent Sentinels. These women stood there in all weather. Day and night, they were out there holding signs. In the winter, they had bricks that they would heat so they could stand on heated bricks in the cold. When war broke out, it became a major debate whether the suffragists should continue to picket the White House. There were many who were offended that they would picket a sitting president, particularly during war. That's when some violence broke out against the women at the White House. And then the women were accused of disrupting the peace, even though they hadn't started it. And they were sent off to the Algonquin prison, which was a horrible, horrible institution where they were terribly mistreated and they did have hunger strikes, which ultimately meant force feedings. <laughs> 
those who survived had an event in Washington, D.C. to celebrate their return when they were released and to honor and recognize what they had done. There was a mark put next to each candidate for office on where they stood on the women's franchise. And that turned each local election into a mini referendum on this. And candidates were fearful of being identified with hostility to the women's vote. There was a young 24-year-old legislator, Harry Byrne, who was scheduled to vote against suffrage. His mother, however, believed that women should get the vote. And she sent him a message that was delivered to him during all of this debating. And at the very end, he changed his vote and voted in favor of suffrage. They didn't hear his vote at first, they had to recount it, and it was silence for a time until the women in the gallery figured out they got it. This was it. Nineteenth Amendment passes, right? Jubilation. <laughs> absolute jubilation, but it shouldn't obscure the fact that there were still large segments of both white women and African-American women who could not vote for various reasons. And the next four decades will be pivotal in trying to open up the franchise to those groups in a way that's meaningful. A lot of people don't get to pick their leaders. We do. So why let that opportunity just pass you by when you could very easily just walk into your nearest voting booth and just say, I want this person to represent me. My name is Selena. I'm 19 years old and I vote. Approximately every year, 4 million people turn 18. The young people directly have that potential and have that power to sway these elections. And I think it's important because the youth are the future and it's important for young people to vote and to pick their leaders. My name is Jamal, I'm 20 years old, and I voted because it's my civic duty. The best way to get someone to come out to vote is one-on-one, -on -one, knocking on their doors, making that human connection, building relationships.